Nina, a story of Nina Simone by Tracy N. Todd and Christian Robinson. Eunice Kathleen Wayman came into this world on February 21st, 1933, in the small town of Tryon, North Carolina. She wasn't the first Wayman child or the last, but she was the only one who sang before she could talk and found rhythm before she could walk. The only one with music on the inside. There was music on the outside too, Mama was forever singing church songs as she baked the biscuits and stirred the beans. And daddy played the upright, small upright piano. Sometimes when mama was away, daddy set Eunice on his knee and put her fingers atop his as he played his favorite good time jazz. Eunice learned so quickly that it wasn't long before daddy was lounging on the porch, listening to Eunice play all on her own. Then suddenly daddy would whistle, quick, mama's coming. And Eunice would slip into mama's favorite hymn without missing a note. Mama was a minister and thought jazz was unholy music. She preached all day Sunday and sometimes Wednesday in proper churches and backwood shacks. When Eunice was three, Mama brought her along to play the music of the Lord. She played softly at first, letting Mama warm to her flock. As Mama's power grew, Eunice matched her rhythm, rolling and rolling until at last the congregation was on its feet, overcome by the message and the music. When she wasn't preaching, Mama worked as Mrs. Miller's maid. She didn't love the job, but she had many mouths to feed and not a lot of choices. To pass the hours, she liked to tell Mrs. Miller how talented Eunice was. When at last Mrs. Miller heard Eunice play, she knew the little girl had a gift. So she introduced Eunice to her friend, a piano teacher named Muriel Mazinovich. The next Saturday, Eunice walked three miles to Miss Mazzy's house. It was deep in the woods and a world away. There were lemon drops, sunlight in the ceiling, and a shiny grand piano. Miss Mazzy taught Eunice to curl her fingers, straighten her back, and play concertos and fugues, classical music. Miss Mazzy called it, written long ago for kings and queens. The music of Johann Sebastian Bach was Eunice's favorite. She liked the way it started softly, then tumbled to thunder, like mama's preaching. After her lessons, Eunice walked to Mrs. Miller's house. While she waited for Mama to finish cleaning, Eunice played with David, Mrs. Miller's son. Sometimes when Mrs. Miller drove Mama home at the end of the day, David came over so he and Eunice could spend more time together. One day, David didn't come to play. And the next time Eunice visited, Mrs. Miller led her son away. She had decided that it wouldn't do for David to play with a little black girl. There was nothing to be done. To help pay for Eunice's piano lessons, Miss Mazzy and Mrs. Miller spread the word about her talent. They collected money in church and wrote about Eunice in the local paper. Soon people came to recognize Eunice on the street. When black folks saw her, they smiled with pride. It made her feel warm and good. When white folks saw Eunice, they pointed and said, that's Miss Mazzy's colored girl. It should not feel good at all. The only other times white folks seemed to notice her was when they didn't want her around. It was another thing Eunice didn't understand, another hurt she pushed down deep. One spring Sunday, as a thank you to all the people who supported her, Eunice gave a concert at the Tyron Library. Daddy and mommy, Mama sat up front so they could watch her hands as she played. Eunice was ready to begin when a man made her parents stand so a white couple could sit. Then the man led her parents away. Eunice waited. Our daddy and mama coming back. 
The audience grew restless. Eunice was still. A wave of anger rolled toward her, but she hardly felt it. At last, the white couple stood and daddy and mama returned to their front row seats. Some white people laughed as their anger cooled. But as Eunice looked at her parents' bowed heads, her anger was just getting warm. After high school, Eunice left Miss Mazzy in North Carolina for the Juilliard School of Music in New York City. She lived on 145th, sorry, 45th Street in Harlem. It was fast and loud and full of good smelling food. The people were so elegant and fine, Eunice wore her best dress every day just to keep up. Eunice had a plan. If she worked hard at Juilliard, in a year, she would be good enough for the real prize, the famous Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia. Eunice was so sure of her plan that her whole family moved to Philly before she even auditioned. The day of her audition, Eunice played each piece of music from memory. She was flawless, but it wasn't enough. The Curtis Institute turned her away. Days later, Eunice heard from her brother, who heard from their uncle, who heard from his Philadelphia friends, that the Curtis Institute had rejected Eunice because she was Black. Eunice didn't know if the rumor was true, but it felt true. That old, familiar anger and hurt came rushing back. And for the first time, Eunice wondered whether being Black meant an end to all her dreams. Eunice gave up music. She worked in a photography studio and didn't play a single note, but the music inside her couldn't be ignored. She became a piano teacher and her students told her about New Jersey bars that hired piano players in the summer. She decided to see it for herself and found her way to a rough Atlantic City club. The piano was shoved in a corner under an umbrella to protect it from a leak. Eunice took the job. The first night, Eunice wore a delicate dress and walked in like a queen. She opened with a Bach concerto, but this was not a Bach-friendly crowd. So Eunice played the popular songs of the day, sneaking in some Bach where she could. When she got more confident, she mixed in some daddy's good time jazz and now and then took the bar to church. And then she sang in a voice that was rich, sweet, and like soft thunder. Eunice played until the sun rose. When she was thirsty, she ordered some milk. If the crowd was too loud, Eunice stopped playing, sipped her milk, and waited for quiet. She could wait all night if she had to. The milk was free. Each night, there were more people in the bar than the night before. They couldn't get enough. But this was unholy music to, for in an unholy place. And Eunice knew Mama wouldn't approve. To keep her secret safe, she changed her name to Nina Simone. Next year, Nina played clubs all over Atlantic City and Philadelphia. She added a new song, a Billie Holiday hit about a man named Porgy and a woman named Bess. Billie sang it sad and blue, but Nina made it dark and deep. She put it on a record and people loved it. Miss Simone had arrived. While Nina sang of love, something else stirred in the streets of Philadelphia. A low rumble of anger and fear, the sound of Black people rising, rising, unwilling to accept being treated as less than human. It was part of a larger chorus that could be heard in New York, Chicago, and all throughout the South. Nina heard it. Underneath the applause and growing praise, Nina heard the steady roar of unrest. Her friends, great writers and thinkers, wanted her to add her voice. She was famous now, and people would listen. But fame was still new to Nina. She worked so hard to keep that spotlight lit and she was exhausted. How could she join a movement when she could hardly move? In 1963, Nina's hard work paid off. She was the main attraction at Carnegie Hall, that spectacular New York theater every musician hoped to play. Miss Mazzy came to see Nina's name in lights. Daddy came too. Even mama was there sitting close enough to see Nina's hands. Nina played 18 songs. At the sound of the last note, the audience was on its feet, clapping, cheering, shouting for more. It was the stuff of dreams, except hundreds of miles away, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. sat in the Birmingham jail. He had marched the streets of that Alabama city demanding respect and dignity. 
Instead, he and his follow followers were posed, beaten, and arrested. And that steady rising roar grew louder, faster, until at last it became the anguished beat of a single drum. Sounded on June 12, 1963, when Medgar Evers, who demanded justice for Black people, was killed in Jackson, Mississippi, by a white man. When Medgar's killer stood trial, the governor of Mississippi shook his hand. The drum sounded again on September 15th when a black church was bombed in Birmingham and Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, and Carol Denise McNair were killed. Nina's own little girl had just turned one year old. The drum beat was relentless, demanding. Its steady rhythm tugged at the hurt Nina had tucked away for so long and set it free. Nina pushed all of it into a raging storm of a song. She called out Alabama and Mississippi by name. Her lyrics were so fed up and true, they couldn't be spoken in polite company. But Nina was done being polite. As far as she could tell, politeness had gotten her people nothing. Nina's voice broke with the weight of this new music. It was harder now, rough, defiant, Black people loved her for it. They had always loved her. But now, as they sat at lunch counters, demanding to be served, rode buses, demanding to be seated, and marched, demanding good jobs for good pay, they knew how much she truly loved them. The white backlash, however, was swift and fierce. People smashed her records and threatened her life. So Nina sang louder her voice as steady as the beat of that relentless drum. And when that drum beat sounded on April 4th, 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee, black people looked to Nina to ease their pain. What will happen, she sang, now that the king of love is dead. Nina Simone sang the whole story of black America for everyone to hear. Her voice resounded with the love, joy and power of it all. And when she sang of Black children, you lovely, precious dreams, her voice sounded like hope. 